invite you to open a Bible to the Gospel of John chapter 11 and also 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to be looking at these two passages from God's Word this morning, John chapter 11 and 1 Corinthians 15, as we continue looking at the I am statements of Jesus from the Gospel of John. And the whole goal of studying this part of God's Word is for us to grow, not just in things that we do or become better Christians, but to grow in our knowledge of who Jesus is, of who our God is, and also in our love and trust in him because of who he reveals himself to be. And this morning is a very famous story, one of the most famous stories in all the Gospels, which is the story of Lazarus passing away and then Jesus performing a wonderful miracle by raising him from the dead. Now, the part of the passage that we're looking at is right in the middle of all of that, right? Like, if you know the story, you know that I left off quite a bit of it in the gospel reading, right? If you're familiar with it, you know that the story keeps going, and Jesus performs this wonderful miracle by saying, Lazarus, come out, and Lazarus rises from the dead and comes out of his grave. But the reason I want to just look at this middle section is because it's in that middle section in between Lazarus passing away and all the grief and sorrow that comes with it and the amazing miracle of the resurrection, that, that's where Jesus meets with his people. And that's in the middle is where Jesus gives them the promise that we hold on to. Right? We, we all want, naturally, as human beings, to do what? Just jump to the end part where Lazarus is raised from the dead, right? We, how many of you just want to jump to the end part where the miracle happens in your life, right? Whether it's Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, giving you a spouse, giving you children or grandchildren, restoring a friendship or relationship, it's giving you a new job, whatever the thing that you are praying for, how many of you want to jump from the middle part that's all messy and painful where you're waiting for the promise and just get to the the promise part already? Anybody? Just like, you're like, can we just get to the part where Lazarus walks out of the grave? Because that would be really cool, right? And there's this middle part that we actually just call life. That's what it is, right? There's this living that's going on, and in the middle of the living, of this middle part of life, there are ups and downs, there's pains and sorrows, there's grief, there's loss, like Mary and Martha are suffering and going through with the loss and the death of their brother, their their beloved brother and family member, Lazarus. And in the middle of that, they're doing what? A lot of what we're doing, they're waiting for the miracle, right? They're hoping for it. They're praying for it. They're they're even trusting that it's going to happen. But guess what? For Mary and Martha, what's real? Lazarus is where? He's dead, right? He's in the grave. And I think it's so important to the story that we realize that it's in that messy middle of life, where we're having to wait, we're having to trust, we're having to have faith that God will act on our behalf, that that's exactly where Jesus comes and meets Mary and Martha, right? He doesn't just show up and, oh, here's a miracle. He, he meets them where? In the middle of their grief, right? They're weeping, they're heartbroken, life is not going according to plan the way they want, And that's when Jesus shows up. And in fact, we know that this middle part is so important because Jesus does it on purpose. If you read the earlier part of John 11, what you'll find is that Jesus knew about Lazarus being sick ahead of time. Because friends had come and told him and the apostles had told him like, hey, Lazarus is sick and and then Lazarus is dying. We should do something. And Jesus actually waits until he passes to show up. Which leads us to the text of verse 17, the messy middle. When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. It wasn't just right after he had died, he's been gone for four days. 
Now, I know we know in Easter there's three days and then Jesus rises from the dead, and there's whole reasons for that. But in the Jewish mindset and the culture at the time, they believed that at, in that three-day period, God could raise someone from the dead. And what they believed is once you hit the fourth day, zero hope. No more rising from the dead. Right? Now, think about that for a moment. It, Right? John includes that detail for you and me for a reason. Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days, so everybody around Mary and Martha are what? They're kind of giving up. We prayed about it. Anybody ever really prayed hard, like the hardest you've ever prayed in your whole life? That's what they're going through. Like we, We've done it. We've been praying. We've been waiting. We've been trusting, hoping whatever the miracle is, whatever we're hoping and praying for God to do in our lives or in a loved one's life, and they hit the fourth day in the middle of the mess, and they're what? Well, that's just time to move on. Right? How often in our lives are you in the messy middle, and you kind of hit the fourth day, maybe not literally four days, but sometimes maybe four days, right? You hit that fourth day, and you just want to do what? Just throw your hands up in the air like, I... Anybody, don't show your hands, but just see if we're all human today. Gotten to the point where you're like, I guess it's just not going to happen. And you kind of move on to the next thing to pray for or the next thing to hope for. You kind of just, anybody ever kind of just put whatever that miracle was to the side and say, I just don't, it's been four days. Just don't think it's going to happen. And they just kind of keep going through the messy middle, right? So it's been four days. The miracle has passed. They think there is no hope. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And in verse 19, many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Now, don't dive too deep into this of like, oh, one of them is better than the other, right? They're just both grieving. But here's what happens in verse 21, which I think is one of the most human Bible verses in your Bible. Martha knows Jesus is coming. She's in the messy middle. We've been praying. We've been hoping. By the way, they were probably praying before Lazarus died. They weren't just praying like, okay, can you raise him from the dead? Right? How many of you would agree with me? They were probably praying way before that. Right? He's sick and he's done. It's getting worse. Let's keep praying. So imagine Martha just praying and praying, pouring your heart and soul out, expecting and hoping and trusting for God to do a miracle of all miracles, to change life. And then you hear Jesus is coming. On one hand, I know we're in church. (laughs) So we all think, well, if Jesus is showing up, I'm just going to be excited, and I'm going to tell him how awesome he is, and I'm going to fall down and worship him, right? Because we're in church, and that's what you're supposed to do. And I I love Martha in this story, because she's in the middle of the mess. She's in the middle of struggling with, I prayed for this miracle, and then I prayed for this miracle, and then I prayed for this one, and now I don't think it's going to happen, and I'm giving up. And then Jesus shows up, and so she goes to greet him. And she says to him, Lord, so she's reverent, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. I like them all, but this is one of my favorites. If you had been here. Like, to me, it's one of the most human Bible verses in the whole Bible, right? I've been praying for him to get better while he was sick. And we don't know how long he was sick, but probably a long time. I'm praying for one miracle after another. Maybe this thing will help, or maybe this thing in our lives will change. And then he dies, and so we've been praying for three days that, God, you would do the most miraculous thing of all miracles, conquer death and raise him from the dead, which means they believed what? He could do it. And then they get to the point where it's four days and they just, well, I guess that miracle's not going to happen, right? For so many of us in life, we get to that fourth day, we're in the messy middle, we're just like, I don't know if it's going to happen. 
I don't know if I could keep praying about it and waiting for it and hoping for it because I'm tired of being let down. I'm tired of being disappointed. I'm tired of it not coming through. And then Jesus shows up and you're like, oh, that's supposed to be great. But instead, Martha goes, if you had been here. Now, here's the reality of human experience that I know. is Pretty much every human being hits a point at some time in your life where you're supposed to be praying and I want to be reverent to the Lord, but all you want to shout out to him is, if you had been here, right? If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. You could have healed him. You could have brought forgiveness in this relationship. You could have brought reconciliation. You could have done this and you could have done that. You could have provided for me in this way, right? Whatever you and I have been praying for and waiting for and hoping for, whatever miracle it is, and, and we've hit the fourth day of the messy middle, we're just losing our minds, there's usually a point in time where we all hit this wall. We just want to shout out to God. And if you had been here, things would have been different. Now, here's what I love about this story. Is that it doesn't end with Jesus just walking away from Martha being like, well, you should have been more faithful. You should have been more grateful. Or how dare you talk to me like that? Right, because I know we're in church, so we all know that, like, well, you're not supposed to talk to God like that, right? But how many of you have, <laughs> outside of church, talked to God like that, right? And you've just been like, I'm a little more like Martha today than Mary sitting there calmly praying, okay, <laughs> right? And what I love about this story is that Jesus doesn't walk away from her going, why would you talk to me like that? Well, don't you just keep, you should just keep trusting. You should just keep praying, right? He doesn't beat her up. He doesn't walk away from her and abandon her. He doesn't like condemn her. And what that reveals to you of me as we are trying to, through God's word, get to know who our Jesus is better is that Jesus can handle whatever your prayer looks like. You can have the most humble, awesome prayer ever. And sometimes your prayer conversation with Jesus can look a lot like Martha, which is just, God, if you had been here. And at other times, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, your prayers are nothing but groans and sighs and tears, and those count too. This is who our Jesus is, is that whatever you and I are going through in life, Whatever miracle we're hoping and waiting for, whatever messy middle we feel stuck in and that no miracle is coming because we just got to move on. It's been four whole days. He's a Jesus who, who, who is with you and meets you in that messy middle. And he doesn't condemn you or kick you away. He doesn't abandon you and be like, well, you should have been more grateful. You should have been more patient, right? You should have been more faithful. No, he just says, oh, okay, that's how you're feeling. I understand. Isn't that beautiful? That we can be like Martha and in the messy middle cry out to God, if you had been here. Now, John doesn't have a lot of details, but I'm assuming because as a pastor, I've walked with people through a lot of grief. And as a human being, I've lost loved ones. That I don't think Martha is saying it with the kindest of tones. Right? That's an assumption on my part. I don't think she's just... Telling you, you know, hey, if you had been here, but it's okay because you're here now, right? As a human being, I think Martha is saying it from a brokenhearted place. And if you had just been here, this would have been totally different. So here's the next line from Martha. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. So here's the beauty of Martha in this story. She is totally a normal human being like you and me, brokenhearted and messy middle going, if you had been here, but at the same time, still trusting in who? God and Jesus and all that he could do for us. So she's saying, look, it's been four days. And we think that's too far for the miracle to happen. It hurts too much. There's a lot of grief here. We, we were disappointed and brokenhearted, but... I still believe you're the God of miracles. I still believe that, that God, through Jesus, can do anything. And isn't that what faith 
this side of heaven looks like, right? It is this bold, beautiful belief and trust that God, you can absolutely do anything mixed with the realities of a sinful, broken world where we're crying out to God, and if you had been here. It's a both and. This is what following Jesus as a human looks like. This is what it looks like to trust him in the realities of the messy middle is that on the one hand, if you had been here, on the other hand, but I know you can still do anything. One of my favorite Bible verses when Jesus says, with God, nothing is impossible. Any of you heard that one before? How many, or show of hands, how many of you like it? Yeah, it's a good one to like slap on your refrigerator, remind yourself, right, every day. It is one of my favorite Bible verses. And if I'm being honest with you as your pastor, hopefully you still like me after this. It is one of the hardest Bible verses for me to believe. Does that make sense to anybody? I mean, I believe it. I, I totally trust that Jesus really meant it. I believe that it's really true. But there are other times where you're in the messy middle and you're just shouting, if you had been here, and it feels like, okay, yeah, you're, you're the God of the impossible, but, but this hurts, <laughs> or this isn't going the right way, right? Which is why one of my favorite prayers in the whole Bible is when the centurion tells Jesus, I believe, but, but help my unbelief, right? And this is what I love about Martha. She's right in the messy middle. Four days have passed. The, the miracle seems impossible. She's saying, if you had been here, but even now, even when it seems the most impossible of impossibles, right? I mean, a resurrection was, seemed like an impossible miracle, but a resurrection after four days, that's just really not going to happen. And what does Martha say? But even now, even with all these things being true, I still believe what? That God can do anything. And then Jesus says something that makes you angry if your friend says it to you. And here's what I mean. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now, is that true? A little bit louder for the Lutherans in the back. Is that true? Yeah, right? that's the whole point of Christian. Your brother will rise again. Cool. But he's dead right now. Right? So what does Jesus do? He says something that is 100% true and right. But if you're Martha, guess what? It doesn't come on, man. <laughs> like, that's not what I'm asking for. Someday down the road, miracle. What is she asking for? A to, like here right now. How about today be the day he rises again? Wouldn't that be great? No? Okay, great. Well, I think it would be cool. I bet Martha does too, right? I've been to a lot of funerals, officiated a lot of funerals, and it's true. That's, that's the thing we preach as pastors at funerals, we rise again. And you know what happens at every funeral I've ever been to? All the people in the room trusting in that promise are guess what they're doing? They're still crying. And they're still hurting. And so for Martha, it's like, yeah, Jesus, that's a wonderful promise. And in fact, we're going to read in a moment, Martha believes that promise. But what she's praying for is, could, could you make that happen now, though? Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. <laughs> so what's Martha saying? You're not telling me anything new, Jesus. I already knew that part. But isn't this what faith looks like? She knows the promises. She knows the future work of God. And yet, where does she find herself? In the messy middle, going what? It hurts. I'm heartbroken. I would still like to see that miracle happen here and now. So yeah, I know Jesus is going to rise on the last day. But... It'd be really great if that could happen right now. Now, this is true for all of us. The last promise that God makes in 
the Bible and Revelation is that he's going to wipe away every tear, get rid of all grief and sorrow. He's going to get rid of the old way of things, and everything's going to be made new again. There's not going to be any sin or brokenness. So what that means is every aspect of our lives, every miracle that you and I are praying for, every hope and dream that we have, Jesus is saying, I'm going to make it all a reality in the heaven when I return and make all things new again. That's a wonderful promise. And that's a true promise for you and me. Just like your brother will rise again was a true promise for Martha. But just like Martha, you and I can sit here and go, I know that Bible verse. (laughs) I know that promise. You can even say, I believe that promise. But how many of you ever shouted but at God? And you've just been like, but, Lord. Still calling you Lord and reverence. But. If you had been here, I wouldn't have to keep waiting. Oh, I know it's going to happen, but if you had been here, things would have worked out totally differently. Now, here's where the real powerful statement happens. Jesus, in verse 25, says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, how many of you already knew that statement, right? Yeah, it's one of the most famous I am statements. But I want you to see it in the context of what's happening to Martha, what she's going through, what you and I are going through in the messy middle where we're going, I know the promise that's true down the road. I know the resurrection down there. I know he'll rise again. I know you're going to restore all things. I know you're going to wipe away the tears. I know you're going to get rid of the grief and sorrow. But if you had been here, would have been different. That Jesus is telling Martha, I am here. Right? He doesn't say, I will be the resurrection and the life. Does he? He doesn't say, I'll get there eventually and bring you with me. What does he say? He says, I what? Am here and now in the messy middle, Martha, with Lazarus in the grave, Here I am, the resurrection and the life. Everything you have been praying for and waiting for and hoping for, here I am. And that is the promise that Jesus has given to Martha and to you and me and to everybody else that feels stuck in the messy middle of life. Yes, there are promises down the road for you, but in the meantime, he is here. He says, I am the resurrection, and the life. It's, it's not something you've got to wait for. It's here and now for you, Martha. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then here comes the question that not just Martha needs to answer, but you and me and every other human being. Do you believe this? No. She's being asked this question at her brother's funeral. That's what's happening, right? It's one thing for you and I to sit in church or in Sunday school, and you should come to Bible class, it's wonderful, and say, oh yeah, I've heard that Bible verse that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, right? Oh, I've heard those promises where he's saying, I'm gonna fix everything, I'm gonna restore everything, wipe away all the tears. I've heard all of that. And it's one thing to sit in here when it feels safe and we feel like, yeah, this life is going good, and then what? Say, I believe those things. And it's another thing where you're in the midst of the heart-wrenching, if you had been here, Lord, messy middle of life, to still say, yeah, I believe it, right? It's one thing if everything's going great in life, and nothing's, going, nothing's bothering you, you're just in a wonderful season, and you're sitting in church, someone goes, oh, do you believe in Jesus? Right? If I just ask you, like, how many of you show hands? Do you believe in Jesus? I'd like to see more. We'll work on that. <laughs> okay. That wasn't a trick question. Are right, you believe in Jesus? Yeah. How, how do we believe? He's the resurrection of life. Show of hands. Let's be proud, Lutherans. All right? How many believe? Yeah, he's going to come back, and he's going to keep his promises. Great. Yeah, wonderful. And yet, when you are Martha, here's what I know as a human and as a pastor who's walked with people through lots of different types of grief. 
It's one thing to raise our hands boldly in church, you know, things are going good. And it's another thing when you're in the messy middle, you know, that heartbreaking moment like Martha, going, oh, and Jesus shows up and says, I am the resurrection of life. I promise you I'm real and I'm here for you. And then to be asked the question, do you believe this? Right? And what I love about Martha, what a wonderful person of faith. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. You could stop the story there, and it would be enough. Right? It would. Because Martha is showing, I believe that you are the Messiah. I believe that you are the resurrection of life here and now in the messy middle. Now, of course, the beautiful thing is that they get the resurrection there and then. Lazarus comes out of his grave. But for you and me, we need this messy middle part. <laughs> we, we need the part where Jesus shows up in the mess and the heartache of Martha's life and says, here I am. I'm not a distant promise. I'm not something that's far away from you. I'm not an absent God. I'm the resurrection of life right here in front of you, with you in the messy middle, sitting right next to the grave with you. And then he asked the question, do you believe this? And you and I need to be able to say yes, just like Martha did. Because this is the whole point of what it means to be a Christian. As a pastor, you get a lot of comments on your sermons. You should try it sometime, it's fun. <laughs> and some of the comments you get over the years is, and I've gotten this a lot, well, could you, could you make it more practical? Well, can you get to the real stuff? Can you get to the parts about like my marriage and my kids and this thing and that thing? And look, the Bible has lots of wisdom for those things and I try to put it in there. Here's the reality. And I'm telling this because I love you as your pastor. None of that is the point of Christianity. None of that is the message of the gospel that will save your kids and your grandkids and your friends who don't believe in Jesus. The point of your faith, the essence of Christianity, is that Jesus has risen from the dead. And the way you and I and the whole world get salvation is by answering the question, do you believe this? The way Martha did by saying, yes, I believe you are the Savior. I believe you are the Son of God. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I would love to spend the next two hours reading the entire chapter to you. But I'm just gonna show you a couple of verses that I want you to highlight and take note of. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse three. 1 Corinthians 15, verse three. St. Paul says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, right? Paul says, of first importance. Now here's what that means in Greek, of first importance. There's no other way to translate it. Right? What he's saying is here is the whole essence of our faith. Here's the thing that is the most important part about Jesus. Everything else is secondary and tertiary. Yet as humans, we love to get stuck in the weeds and those things. So St. Paul is writing to a church. By the way, 1 Corinthians is one of the most practical books Paul ever wrote. It's all about the Christian life. And after 14 chapters of all about the Christian life and worship and how to do church, all that's in there, you know what Paul says? Here is of first importance, here is the most important thing. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Jesus was buried and Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. The most important part about Christianity is Jesus. The whole point of you and me believing in Jesus is that he has risen from the dead. And in fact, later on in 1 Corinthians 15, St. Paul will even say that. He will say, 
if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then our faith is pointless. Here's the reality, friends. Not just for you, but for everybody in your life. The resurrection of Jesus is the most practical thing of Christianity. Because every single one of us and every single person in your life will at times find themselves like Martha, heartbroken in the messy middle of life, going, God, if you had been here. And Jesus is making this promise saying, I am here. I am the resurrection and the life that you desire and that you need. When my Aunt Tracy was 41, she passed away from cancer. And she is the youngest of my mother's siblings. She was the sixth child. So our whole family was absolutely devastated and broken because she was like the most joyful person in the world. And I remember after the funeral, my brother and I being asked a lot of questions because we're the pastors in the family. And I remember we were all sitting together and my Uncle Ray looked at me and he goes, all right, man. I was like, what? Because I'm, by the way, crying because <laughs> my Aunt Tracy had just died. And he's looking at me and he goes, like, all right, man, give me something good. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, come on, like, give, me, give me something good. Give me, give me some hope. Because why? Because that's what we all need as humans. We all end up like Martha going, hey, if you had been here, it's been four days, right? And so what I did was I looked at my Uncle Ray, and I just said, first Christmas, I said, well, Ray, here's what I believe. Jesus forgave Tracy and loved Tracy. She's with him in heaven now, and one day he's gonna get rid of all the cancer in her body and raise her again. And he looked at me and goes, is that it? Is that all you got? I said, yeah. That's all I've got, Ray. <laughs> By the way, that's all all of us have. That's all you have. That's all I have. It's all anybody in your life that you meet that's like Martha going, God, if you had been here, hey, I've been praying for a long time. It's been four days. It's been four years. It's been four decades. And all any of us have, according to God's word, is the good news that Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Not way over there, but right here. Now, before I break down and cry more, we're going to pray. Okay. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that in the messy middle of life, when our hearts are crying out like Martha, if you had been here, you are a gracious and loving God who says, I am here. I am the resurrection and the life. Holy Spirit, give us faith to trust in that promise each and every day, even when it feels impossible. And give us the words to say to our friends and family who are in the messy middle of life and going things, through things like Martha, that we be able to share the good news and the comforting news that Jesus is the resurrection and the life for them as well. In your name we pray. Amen.